It's a great pleasure for me to be back uh, here at the Quay. Uh, I was, I, I spoke uh, to the Quay, I think, in 2004, and it's a great pleasure to see how the Quay has has grown. Uh, institutions, academic institutions like this, are are very few around the world, uh, and they're very precious. Uh, they deserve support, and all of us uh, around the world, I think, are grateful for the existence of centers uh, such as the Quebec, which is so important for all of our work. Also, uh, it's wonderful that a group like the Quebec that is grounded in feminist research and in research into gender should also be accommodating to work in uh, sexuality studies and specifically in lesbian, gay, and queer sexuality. Uh, it's um, uh, important to me, and I hope what I say today will indicate some of the reasons why it is useful to think about sexuality in the context of gender, even though Gender often nowadays simply means women, and I want to indicate that, uh, as we all know, gender also applies to men. And I'm going to be talking, of course, about gay men in particular. I want to begin with a particular claim, with a single claim. Gay men, I assert, gay men have a particular, distinctive, characteristic relation to the culture of the larger society in which they live. Gay men have a particular, distinctive relation to the larger society in which they live. That phenomenon is routinely acknowledged as a fact, but it is often just as routinely denied as a truth. Let me explain. That gay men have a specific, non-standard attachment to certain cultural objects and certain cultural forms is the assumption that underlies a lot of popular humor. No one will look at you aghast, or cry out in protest, or stop you in mid-sentence if you dare to imply that a guy who adores Lady Gaga, who worships actresses like Morina in Kiss of the Spider Woman, who knows Marlena Dietrich's best lines by heart, or who would never dream of dressing for comfort, no one will be horrified if you imply that such a man just might possibly not be completely straight. How do you know if your cockroaches are gay? That's the old joke. You come home and all your furniture is rearranged. <laughs> so this is the stuff of popular stereotype. Perhaps, for that very reason, if you dare to assert in all seriousness that male homosexuality involves a set of non-standard cultural practices, not just some non-standard sexual practices. If you suggest that there is such a thing as gay male culture, or that there is a connection between kinds of sexuality and specific cultural forms, well, then people will immediately object, citing a thousand different reasons why such a thing is impossible or ridiculous and why anybody who says otherwise is deluded, completely out of date, morally suspect, and politically irresponsible. Which probably won't stop the very people who make those objections from telling you the cockroach joke, even in their very next breath. So, my task today is to try and occupy 
for an entire 45 minutes. Whatever gap I can manage to prize open between the acknowledged fact of gay male cultural difference and its disavowed truth. Luckily for me, the view that I am propounding is not entirely new. Already in 1954, the psychoanalyst Carl Jung noted that gay men, quote, may have good taste and an aesthetic sense, unquote. By the late 1960s, the anthropologist Esther Newton could speak quite casually of, quote, the widespread belief, widespread, the widespread belief that homosexuals are especially sensitive to matters of aesthetics and refinement. Many gay men, and a number of their straight friends and enemies, have long suspected that what makes gay men different from everybody else is not uh, something that's merely sexual, but something, in fact, that goes beyond matters of sexual preference. Richard Florida, a U.S. economist and social theorist, as well as a self-declared heterosexual, may have inadvertently documented the truth of this ancient suspicion. In a series of empirical studies, highly contested empirical studies, but nonetheless, in a series of empirical studies of what he has called the creative class, Florida has argued that the presence of gay people in a city is an excellent predictor of a viable high-tech industry and its potential for growth. That's because high-tech jobs nowadays, according to Florida, follow the workforce and seek out creative people wherever such people happen to be. The workforce does not move to where the jobs are, at least not for very long. They may move for a while to take a job, but then they will move back uh, to where they like to live. So if cities and towns with lots of gay people in them are sure to prosper in what Florida called the creative age. And that's not only because the new class of creative workers is composed of what he calls nerds, oddballs, and people with extreme habits and dress who gravitate to barriers with, quote, low entry barriers to human capital, unquote. That is to say, places where the locals are generally tolerant of unconventional folk. It's also because gay people, according to Florida, are the canaries of the creative age, canaries in the gold mine. Uh, that is to say, gay people can flourish only in a pure atmosphere, uh, characterized by high levels of lifestyle amenities, coolness, culture and fashion, vibrant street life, and a cutting edge music scene. They don't have those things, they perish, apparently. Um, so the presence of gay people in large numbers is an indicator of an underlying culture that's open-minded and diverse, and thus conducive to creativity. It also signals an exciting place where people can fit in and be themselves, where the people climate is good, and quality of place represents an important community value. All of that would seem to provide empirical confirmation, however flimsy, of the notion that homosexuality is not just a sexual orientation, but also a cultural orientation, a dedicated commitment to certain <coughs> social or aesthetic values, an entire way of being. Uh, that distinctively gay way of being appears to be rooted in a particular queer way of feeling. And that queer way of feeling, that queer subjectivity, expresses itself through a specific dissonant way of relating to cultural objects, movies, songs, clothes, books, works of art, and cultural forms in general art and architecture, opera and musical theater, pop and disco, style and fashion, emotion and language. As a cultural practice, male homosexuality involves a characteristic way 
of receiving, reinterpreting, and reusing mainstream culture, a way of decoding and recoding the heterosexual or heteronormative meanings already encoded in that culture so that they come to function as vehicles of gay or queer meaning. It consists in a shared alternative reading of mainstream culture. In this way, certain media figures become gay icons. They get taken up by gay men with a peculiar intensity that differs from their wider reception in the straight world. And certain cultural forms, such as Broadway musicals, or Hollywood melodramas, or musicals or melodramas in general, get invested by gay men with particular significance and attract a disproportionate number of gay male fans. Why? Why? What is the logic of the connection between culture and sexuality? What does male homosexuality have to do with dancing, or cooking, or the music you like, or the car that you drive, or the clothes that you wear, or your attachment to period design? Are these just stereotypes about gay men? Are they expressions of a kind of sexual racism? Is there anything at all to these stereotypes? Anything behind them? Well, if we could discover what male homosexual desire has to do with specific cultural forms, modes of feeling, and kinds of discourse, then we might be in a position to understand the larger relations between sexuality and culture. And we might be able to grasp what I would call the sexual politics of cultural form. The sexual politics of cultural form. We might also have a new way of understanding subjectivity and of understanding human subjectivity without recourse to psychology. There must be ways of getting at the inner life of human subjects and of gay men in particular without delving into the peculiar psychic constitution of the individual, without adopting the essentially medical outlook of psychology, which has been particularly punitive to gay men, and which treats all human mental life as either healthy or diseased. And I think it's important to remember that psychology is based in medicine. So the study of social practices of aesthetic practices, styles, tastes, feelings, analyzed so as to disclose their internal structures, their formal logic, cultural operation, meaning, distribution, that could provide an alternate and fresh approach to human subjectivity. In the case of gay male subjectivity, one way to depersonalize, de-individualize, and therefore de-psychologize it would be to ask how male homosexual desire connects with specific cultural forms, modes of feeling, styles, and kinds of discourse. So that is my project in my new book uh, called How to Be Gay, which I've just finished. It should be out next year, and I'm going to try to give you a small indication of what I have to say in it uh, today. For the rest, you all have to go to the book. <laughs> now, let me begin by making a sort of general methodological point, and that is a culture and I'm talking about gay male culture. But a culture is not the same thing as a collection of individuals. It's not just a bunch of individuals. Almost any generalization one can make about a culture will be false as soon as it is applied to individuals. So, for example, French culture is characterized by a particular relation 
to the production and consumption of wine. But that doesn't mean that wine holds the same significance or value for all French individuals. Although the French, in general, may care more about wine than North Americans do, some people in the United States care a great deal more about wine than do many people in France. Just because you're French doesn't mean you have to like wine. And you can refuse to drink a drop of wine and still be French. <laughs> it also takes more than liking wine to make you French. Liking wine, however passionately, will not, in and of itself, make you French. At the same time, certain social practices pertaining to wine are distinctive to French culture, and to be French is to be alert to the cultural meanings connected to wine drinking, to have at least some kind of attitude to the practice of wine consumption and appreciation, even if it is an attitude of total indifference or rejection. And I think you could say the same thing about gay men and Judy Garland, or gay men and Lady Gaga, gay men and Lady Gaga, or gay men and any and Broadway musicals, or Hollywood melodramas, and, and so on. It's, a culture is not about individuals. So the kind of coherence that a culture has will not be reflected in any uniformity of attitude or belief on the part of a population. And yet, cultural differences between France and the United States certainly do exist. For example, it's not an accident that some friends of mine from Paris who were making their first trip to the United States and who um, arrived uh, starving at the airport uh, in Detroit and whom I picked up and took directly from the airport to a local cafe in my university town at the University of Michigan. Um, it's not an accident that they concluded from the way the waitress um, approached us and talked to us and asked for our feelings about our feelings on various topics and what we thought about this and that. It's no accident that they felt that she must have been a very old friend of mine. But they were wrong. <laughs> but, um, but, there, but, but that was a mistake, but it wasn't an accident. That was the outcome of a certain cultural logic. So my point is that cultural differences are best captured by the pragmatics of discourse, and specifically by the pragmatics of genre. It's, it's, so the generic conventions, for example, that govern what a waitress can say to a new client in a restaurant in Michigan without causing surprise or shock or bewilderment obviously differ from the generic conventions that govern similar interactions in restaurants in Paris. So that's why my friend we made that mistake. Now, I'm well aware of all the reasons why it might seem hazardous to speak about gay male cultures. Uh, the foremost danger is that of essentialism, uh, implying that there is some property or category common to all gay men that all gay men share. But to say that, to make an objection to my proceeding as essentialist would be to confuse a culture and the practices that constitute it with the population of individuals who belong to it. So there is such a thing as French culture, but it doesn't extend either universally or in its totality to everybody who lives in the French nation or who defines themselves as French. And in, a, in the same way, what I'm calling gay male culture Gay male cultural practices are not shared in their totality by all members of the gay population in the United States, let alone the world, whereas at least some of those practices are shared by many people who are not gay. Okay. So a culture is not the same thing as a population. And in order to get at what I mean by gay male culture, I'm going to be looking at genres of discourse in the same way that in order to define French culture, it might be less useful to talk about your relationship to wine than it might be to talk about 
what are the genres or conventions that govern what you say when you interact with other people, um, say, in a restaurant? Um, now, not every man who happens to be homosexual necessarily belongs to a gay culture or displays a gay sensibility. As you know, the merest peek into any clothing shop or clothing catalog that caters specifically to gay men will be enough to shatter forever the stereotypes that gay men necessarily, intuitively, have good taste. That's sad, but true. Um, and, and many people take part, uh, many, many non-gay people take part in gay male culture, and many of, the, many of them are, are much better at it than I am, um, which isn't saying much because I've always been told that I'm a terrible failure as a gay man. But um, in any case, um, the, the point is, I'm going to be looking, to, uh, I'm going to be looking to generic practices for indications of cultural difference. And so I'm going to begin with this particular example of a genre of discourse of a generic practice. Forty years ago, in her book Mother Camp, uh, a path-breaking ethnographic study of female impersonators and drag queens in Chicago and Kansas City, the anthropologist Esther Newton remarked that, quote, one of the most confounding aspects of my interaction with these impersonators was their tendency to laugh at situations that, to me, were horrifying or tragic. So according to her admission, Newton was confounded by a clear violation of the boundary between genres. Situations that are horrifying or tragic should not elicit laughter from those who witness them. That's what comic situations do. When tragic situations elicit laughter, normal bystanders, uh, normal bystanders are confounded because their social and discursive expectations far from being met, have been turned upside down. Now, female culture, as it turns out, has a long history of laughing at situations that, to others, are horrifying or tragic. One must have a heart of stone, Oscar Wilde said, to read the death of little Nell in Charles Dickens without laughing. This technique of switching from horror to humor and back again has a wide use in gay male culture. Here is the contemporary English playwright Neil Bartlett, Oscar Wilde's modern avatar, uh, describing that technique with reference to a moment in the 1973 play Neil by Charles Ludlum. Ludlum's ridiculous theatrical company in New York specialized in pastiche, as well as in outlandish drags and stagings of various classics from the history of world drama. In this case, Garbo's 1936 film Camille, based on La Dame au Camélia and La Traviata. And here is what Bartlett says about one scene in this play. I think the blowjob gag in the final act of Camille is the funniest thing ever performed. It's this absolutely great moment where you're really crying. It's the final act of Camille, and she's in bed, dying of consumption, and Armand, her lover, is there. It's very moving, and you're going, I'm about to be terribly moved. This is really going to get to me. And she starts coughing, and the actor reproduces precisely Maria Collins' cough, and Armand is sitting by the side of the bed, and she starts coughing, and coughs more and more, and eventually collapses into Armand's lap, and everyone thinks she's coughing, and then the maid comes in and goes, Oh, sorry. <laughs> the leap from Camille <laughs> to this terrible, terrible gag. And, and the maid communicates this delicious sense of, ooh, they've got back together again. She can't be too bad. Things are looking up. It's heaven. 
This is one of the great moments of world theory. So that wrenching, that wrenching switch from tragic pathos to obscene comedy, and then back again, leaves the horror of mortal agony intact, but it does not hesitate to interrupt the tearful sentimentality that might attach to it. Margaret even describes the gag as the funniest thing ever performed, even though by his account, it occurs in a moment of tragic poignancy where you're really crying. This crossing of genres between tragedy and comedy is rooted in long-standing practices of female culture, and especially in drag performance. Without taking into account those practices, or the ways they teach us to violate systematically the generic boundaries between tragedy and comedy, you simply cannot comprehend the gay male cultural response to HIV and AIDS. But that response has featured works of outrageous impertinence, even heartlessness, and I could give you a long list. Uh, for example, uh, just to cite uh, the gay Australian artist David McDermott, who died of complications from HIV and AIDS in 1995. He produced a mock-up of a pornographic magazine for HIV-positive men, an equivalent of Playboy, called Plague Boy, which purported to feature such articles as Half Dead and Hot, and Sex and the Single Tea Cell. The obituary he composed for his best friend and closest collaborator, Peter Tully, began with the following headline, Moody Bitch Dies of AIDS. <laughs> As this example indicates, subscribers to gay male cultural practices make fun, first and foremost, of their own sufferings. If they laugh at situations that are horrifying or tragic, that's not because they do not feel a horror or a tragedy in them, but because they do. They laugh in order not to cry, in order not to lapse into maudlin self-pity. Their self-mockery works to drain their suffering of the pain that it also does not deny. That is why horror can cohabit with hilarity in the pragmatics of gay male discourse, and human calamities like the HIV AIDS epidemic can become vehicles of parody without the slightest implication of cruelty, distance, or disavowal. To make your own suffering into a vehicle of parody, to refuse to exempt yourself from the irony with which you view all social performances, all social roles, and all social identities, is to level social distinctions. By disclaiming any pretense to be taken seriously, and by foregoing all personal entitlement to sympathy, sentimentality, or deference, you throw a wrench into the machinery of social depreciation. For when you make fun of your own pain, you anticipate and preempt the devaluation of it by others. You also invite others to share in your renunciation of any automatic claim to social standing, and you encourage them to join you amid the ranks of people whose suffering is always subject, at least potentially, to devaluation and whose, tra whose tragic situations are therefore always susceptible of being laughed at. You imply that no tragedy, not even yours, can or should claim so much worth as to presume an unquestionable entitlement to be taken completely seriously, that is, to be taken completely straight, in a world where some people's suffering is routinely discounted. You thereby repudiate hierarchies of social worth, according to which individuals are routinely classed. You build a collective understanding and sense of solidarity for those who follow you in your simultaneous pursuit and defiance of social contempt. 
and in that way to lay the foundations for a wider community. The distinction between the kind of humor that is socially inclusive and the kind of humor that is socially exclusive is what defines the generic difference between camp and kitsch, according to the late P. Kosofsky Sedgwick. The application of the kitsch designation, Sedgwick argued, entails a superior knowing dismissal of someone else's love of a cultural artifact. A judgment that the item is unworthy of love and that the person who loves it is the unresistant dupe of the cynical manipulation that produced it. So when I label an object kitsch, I treat the appreciation of it as a fault, as a lapse of taste, as evidence of a debased sentimentality that all I myself have transcended and that I do not share. I thereby exempt myself from the contagion of the kitsch object. Kitsch, then, is never a word one applies to objects of one's own liking, but only to the bad, sentimental, uncritical object choices made by other people. Whereas the judgment that something is camp, Cedric contended, does not confer any exemption. Camp is not about attribution. Thank you very much. Camp is not about attribution, but recognition. It declares your delight and participation in the cultural subversions of camp. Instead of asking, in the case of Kitsch, what kind of debased creature could possibly be the right audience for this spectacle, it asks, what if the right audience were exactly me? Camp description produces the exact opposite effect, then, from Kitsch labeling. It marks the person making the judgment as an insider, someone who is in on the secret of camp, already initiated into the circuit of shared perception and appreciation that set apart those who are able to discern camp and that create among such people a network of mutual recognition and complicity. It takes one to know one. Indeed, and that, camp implies, far from being shameful, is fabulous. Camp is not criticism, then, but critique. In this, it differs from satire, which would be an appropriate way of responding to kitsch, since satire functions as a criticism, as a put-down of inferior objects and practices. Camp does not make fun of things from a position of moral or aesthetic superiority, but from a position internal to the deplorable condition that it lovingly elaborates and extends so as to include everybody, the deplorable condition of having no serious aesthetic standards, of having a loving relation to ghastly objects. Camp doesn't be mean. I mean, I'm sorry, camp doesn't preach. Camp doesn't preach, it demeans. But it doesn't demean some people at other people's expense. Rather, it takes everyone down with it together. It thereby lays the basis for a community built not on pride, but on a shared embrace of indignity. That instinctive race to the bottom, that impulse to identify with the outrageously disreputable and the grotesque, may explain why, as feminists sometimes complain, Camp particularly delights in and systematically exploits the most abject, exaggerated, and undignified versions of femininity that a misogynistic culture can devise. Such caricatures of femininity constitute the epitome of what our society regards as unserious, and they dramatize the full consequences of social and symbolic violence. But for Kemp, the unserious is not just a disqualification, it's also a strategic opportunity. By seizing that opportunity, Kemp endows its anti-social aesthetics with a political dimension. Because 
Uh, to embrace the unserious is to challenge the hierarchies of value that determine relative degrees of social dignity. Hierarchies of value that demean style in favor of content, that elevate masculinity to the range of seriousness, since it's concerned supposedly with reality and the true content of things, while downgrading femininity to the status of triviality, since it is concerned supposedly with such frivolous matters as style and appearance. Furthermore, by putting everything in quotation marks, especially everything serious, Camp opens up a crucial gap between actor and role, between identity and essence, which undercuts the seriousness and authenticity of all naturalized identities, including the inferior identities attached to stigmatized persons. Forgoing your own claim to dignity is a small price to pay for undoing the seriousness of the hierarchies of value that debase you. The distinctive characteristics of Kant make particular sense when they can be brought into relation with a long-standing gay male cultural practice of laughing at situations that are horrifying or tragic, as well as the practice of refusing to exempt yourself from social condemnation. So as you see, I'm, I'm trying to gradually um, build up a sense of uh, the, logical, the logical interrelations of different parts of a kind of cultural system. But my approach to camp should not be in terms of cultural theory. I will want to keep it close to empirical social practices. And uh, once again, for that, I turn to Esther Newton, who helps us understand the nature of camp through its connection to uh, specific social practices. And here is how she does it. Uh, by describing uh, a typical gay male party uh, as the, the sort that she witnessed in the United States in the 1960s. She says, at any given homosexual party, there will be two competing, yet often complementary people around whom interest and activity swirl. The most beautiful, most desirable man there, and the campiest, most dramatic, most verbally entertaining queen. The complementary nature of the two roles is made clearest when, as often happens, the queen is holding the attention of his audience by actually commenting, by no means always favorably, on the beauty and on the strategies employed by those who are trying to win the beauty's favors for the night. The good party and the good drag show both ideally will feature beautiful young men and campy queens. In neither is it likely that the two virtues will be combined in one person. The camp, both on and off stage, tends to be a person who is, by group criteria, less sexually attractive, whether by virtue of advancing age, or fewer physical charms, or frequently both. Whatever the camp's objective physical appearance, his most successful joke is on himself. So here, once again, we see the same refusal of self-exemption that was already implied by the gay male practice of laughing at one's own suffering. What explains the phenomenon observed by Newton? Why is it that in order for a party composed of gay men to be truly successful, there has to be at least one each of two different species of gay men present and in attendance at it, the beauty and the camp. Well, if on the one hand, no one beautiful is present, the gathering loses all erotic interest. It declines into a tea party, a, a meeting of the sisterhood, 
a mere, con a mere congenial get-together of like-minded individuals with nothing to prove to each other and no one, no one to put on a, a macho act for. <laughs> Under those conditions, the participants can afford to abandon all pretense of being better or sexier than they are. And that may make for a fun and convivial evening. But it will be lacking in sexual excitement. And as a mixer, as an occasion for romance, it will clearly be a dud. But if, on the other hand, no camp is present, the party becomes a relentlessly competitive struggle for the most attractive available partners, exercise in mutual one-upmanship, an endless display of humorless macho theatrics which takes place at everyone's expense and produces relentless posturing and suffocating seriousness. So, the camp and beauty are equally necessary, and both are indispensable to successful gay male life. For a good illustration of the opposition between the beauty and the camp, that Newton observed, consider a scene towards the end of the first act of Matt Crowley's 1968 play, The Boys in the Band, the first breakthrough theatrical hit that explicitly and successfully put gay male social life as it was being in, as it was being lived in New York City onto the international stage. So, in this scene, the cowboy a stunningly handsome male hustler who's been brought to the birthday party as a sexual gift for the uh, man, um, as it, for the guest of honor, uh, the cowboy happens to complain about it and seek sympathy for an athletic injury that he lately uh, sustained at the gym. Uh, he says, I lost my grip during my chin-ups. No one is much interested in the details, but he rattles on with endearingly foolish self-absorption. I, I lost my grip during my chin-ups, and I fell on my heels and twisted my back. Emery, the cat, remarks, you shouldn't wear heels when you do chin-ups. <laughs> that joke does a lot of cultural work, but I don't think I can explain it to you. My point is, uh, the camp and the beauty are not just opposed, each is the other's eternal competitor and, and uh, antagonist. A uh, camp is understood best when it is, when it is restored to its original social and discursive context and referred to its original social function as a weapon that gay male culture has fashioned in a hopeless, if valiant, effort to resist the power of beauty. So the camp is in strict relation to beauty. Beauty, because it is an object of sexual desire, because it is hot, has nothing intrinsically ironic about it. Gay men take it very seriously. Beauty evokes literal, witless, pathetically earnest longing the sort of longing that has no distance on itself and no ability to step aside and look critically at itself from an alienated perspective. That is what camp is for. The camp takes revenge on the beauty for beauty's power over gay man, which is why it's fitting that the camp be attractive himself. Um, and he, he takes revenge on beauty on behalf of the community of gay men as a whole, with whom he shares a cozy and ambivalent complicity. The camp's role is to puncture the breathless, solemn, tediously monotonous worship of beauty, to allow the gay men who desire and who venerate beauty to step back ironically from their unironic devotion to it and to see it from the perspective of post-coital disillusionment instead of anticipatory excitation. For, at the moment, as, as, as Jean-Paul Sartre somehow figured out 60 years ago, um, uh, the moment a man first arouses your desire, he appears to you as pure archetype, 
as an embodiment of the masculine erotic value that makes him attractive. He is the jock, the paratrooper, the boy next door. But as soon as you have him, he becomes an, he becomes an individual instead of an essence, an ordinary queen instead of a platonic idea. In other words, he ceases to be pure beauty, and he starts to become camp. He may still frequent the gym, but he might as well be working out at high heels, as far as you were concerned. <laughs> the camp's job is to remind you of that. As a practice, camp is about cutting everyone down to size, especially anyone whose claim to glamour threatens to oppress their less fortunate comrades, such as the camp himself. It's about deflating pretension, dismantling hierarchy, and remembering that all queers are stigmatized, and no one deserves the kind of dignity that comes at the expense of someone else's shame. That is why camp is inclusive, why it implies a world of horizontal rather than vertical social relations, and that is why it both presumes and produces community. The function of beauty, by contrast, is to promote a different and conflicting value, one that gay male culture cherishes no less than it cherishes the value of community. Beauty holds out the possibility of transcending shame, escaping the community of the stigmatons, acceding to the rapt contemplation of pure physical and aesthetic perfection, leaving behind all those saddled themes, forsaking irony for romance, attaining dignity, achieving true and serious worth, both in your own eyes and other people's. Beauty is noble, heroic, qualities we associate that with humor or comedy, of the tragedy. So, and I am now coming to my conclusion. So if gay male culture teaches us to laugh at situations that are horrifying or tragic, that's because it strives to maintain this tension between an egalitarian ethics and a hierarchical aesthetics. Because it insists on keeping those mutually opposed values in permanent equipoise. Egalitarian ethics, hierarchical aesthetics. It's only by preserving this polarity, promoting that contradiction, and making each set of values balance the other out, that it can preserve the right and necessarily the necessary doubling of perspective that keeps everybody sane. The tension between egalitarian ethics and hierarchical aesthetics structures all gay male culture, spanning its democratic and aristocratic tendencies, its feminine and masculine identifications, its division between queens and machos. It, it also accounts for gay male culture's peculiar, distinctive, characteristic love of certain feminine figures, such as Joan Crawford or Judy Garland, defined by their combination of glamour and abjection. The opposition between beauty and the camp corresponds to this contrast between glamour and abjection. But whereas glamour and abjection, or glamour and humor, are hard to combine in the case of masculinity, since they represent a fundamental categorical split, a polarity between good and bad, noble and ignoble, virile and effeminate, serious and unserious men, glamour and abjection coincide easily in the case of femininity. Because even glamorous women are cartoon women who represent only parts of women, because even glamorous women represent aspects of femininity exaggerated to an outlandish degree, and because femininity always has something performative about it and artificial, exceptional feminine glamour is never very far from caricature. The more pronounced or elaborate femininity is, the more it lends itself to parody, and the more it leads to a loss of dignity, to a fall from seriousness. For that reason, representations of feminine abjection do not always feature, they do not need to feature, 
humble women, when we're status women, impoverished, sick, miserable, or struggling women. They can focus just as easily on wealthy, stylish, glamorous, or formerly glamorous women who are hysterical, extravagant, desperate, ridiculous, passionate, obscene, degraded, on the brink of a nervous breakdown, or simply women who are unable to carry off successfully a high-quality feminine masquerade, who fail to sustain the dignity required to be taken even somewhat seriously as women. Now, that account reads like a description of drag. And now, at last, we're in a position to understand why gay male drag specializes in combined portrayals of glamorous and abject femininity. It is through an identification with femininity that gay men can manage to recombine the opposed values of beauty and camp that divide gay male culture. It's through identification with a femininity that is at once glamorous and abject that gay men are able to meld upwardly mobile aesthetic aspiration with the ethical leveling of social distinctions with that race to the bottom. So femininity functions here as a kind of proxy identity for gay men. A proxy identity. The combination of feminine glamour and objection that gay men assume through feminine identification and appropriation makes available to gay men a position that is at once dignified and degraded, serious and unserious, tragic and laughable. And it's only it's the only position, that's the only position, that can claim to be, according to the terms of gay male culture's value system, unitary and complete. Now, the association of masculine beauty and glamour with social superiority, seriousness, sexiness, dignity, and romance may strike you as sexist and politically retrograde, probably because that's exactly what it is. But it is unreasonable to expect gay male culture to undo the dominant social and symbolic system of which it is merely the lucid and faithful reflection. Gay male culture's virtue is to, is to register eloquently forms of social stratification that modern liberal societies routinely deny and that a host of contemporary hypocrisies and pieties, including popular sentimental varieties of feminism, typically work to obscure. Female culture teaches us how to confront the gendered and sexual stratification of the modern social world. Dominant social roles and meanings cannot be destroyed any more than the power of beauty can be destroyed, but they can be undercut. It is possible to learn how not to take them straight. Their claim and our belief is weakened, their preeminence is eroded when they are parodied or punctured, just as sex and gender identities are subverted when they are theatricalized, when they are shown up as roles instead of as essences, treated as social performances instead of as natural identities, and thus deprived of their claim to seriousness and authenticity, and thus of their right to our moral, aesthetic, and erotic allegiance. But, to de-realize dominant heterosexual or heteronormative social roles and their meanings, to disrupt their unquestioning claims to seriousness and authenticity, is not to do away with them or to make their power disappear. It's to achieve a certain leverage in relation to them while acknowledging their continuing ability to dictate the terms of our social existence. That explains why gay male culture refuses to take seriously, literally, or unironically the very things that matter most and that cause us the most pain. It also explains why gay male culture encourages us to laugh at situations that are horrifying 
were tragic. Gay culture does so without devaluing the suffering that it also refuses to dream upon. Just as camp operates to puncture the unironic worship of beauty whose power it cannot rival or displace, so gay male culture struggles to suspend the pain of losses that it does not cease to grieve. Okay, so um, a few last words. Um, gay male culture, according to the very incomplete portrait of it I have sketched today, is a way of coping with powerlessness, neutralizing pain, transforming grief. And that may be why the very idea of gay male culture produces so much aversion nowadays and elicits so much denial. Who wants to feel powerless these days? Who wants to think of himself as a victim? Who even wants to admit to vulnerability? Leftism is over, people. It's no longer fashionable to say you're oppressive. Our society requires its neoliberal subjects to butch up, uh, to maintain a cheerful stoicism in the face of socially arranged suffering. It teaches us not to blame society for our woes, but to take responsibility for ourselves and to find deep personal meaning in our pain and moral uplift, moral uplift in accepting it. So it's understandable that a set of cultural practices designed to cope with the reality of suffering, to defy powerlessness, and to carve out a space of freedom within a social world acknowledged to be hostile and oppressive, would not only, it's, 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 it's understandable that that would only not, that that would not only fail to appeal to many subordinated people nowadays, but would constitute precisely what many of us, women, gay men, and other minorities, must reject in order to accede to a sense of ourselves as dignified, proud, independent, self-respecting, powerful, and happy in spite of everything. In the case of gay men, gay culture is what many of us must disavow in order to achieve gay pride, at least a certain kind of gay pride. It's not that gay pride reflects a different and less agonizing social experience of homosexuality. In its own way, gay pride, too, is a response to continuing stigmatization and marginalization. Rather, gay pride offers a different solution to the same problem by aspiring to a better future, better, that is, than the world as we know it. That is, of course, a worthy aspiration, and it helps to explain the continuing appeal of utopianism in gay theory and in the gay movement. Uh, but it also indicates why traditional male culture, of the sort I've tried to describe to you today, traditional gay male culture, which reckons with the world as it is, affords such an important emotional and political resource, not just to gay men, but to any socially disqualified person whose sense of irredeemable wrongness makes them willing to pay the achingly high price for it. Thank you.